And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are around the world. Uh, you are on the Philippe Matthew Show after hours because it's an after hour topic. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I am here with Joy Artist Williams. Uh, she's a former wife of uh, Chicago uh, Bear uh, superstar James Big Cat Williams. And after 12 years of marriage with the NFL superstar, uh, she found herself writing her memoir. Uh, entitled The Cat I Know, Diary of an Ex-Ball Player's Wife. Uh, and she's currently the CEO of uh, the Barefoot uh, Sandal Company, uh, Tozeries by Joy Artis. And she's a licensed massage therapist uh, living in Chicago. And uh, if you're from Chicago, you know, uh, as she uh, enjoys as well, uh, Garrett's Popcorn. How are you, Joy? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I love, oh my God. That, that's something I do miss. I miss that popcorn. That is delicious. Right. People are standing in line literally around the block, people. I don't know if you, people who have never been to Chicago, uh, it's, it's, it's life changing. Anyway, um, we, you know, uh, of course, I know you, uh, have known you for, for a while now, uh, and have heard this uh, crazy story, read this book. Uh, and it is amazing what you have gone through because looking at you, it's like, oh, you know, you, you don't have a worry in the world, but you have gone through some stuff. Yes, I have. Talk to me. Well, before we get into, uh, and I know we're having some volume issues, so we're going to check to make sure uh, that uh, your, your volume is up. If I have to cut to the camera to you manually, I will. Normally, it's, uh, it automatically activates, but we'll see how we're doing. Before we get into the story of your memoir, let's get into your childhood uh, and what was it like growing up? Were you, are you a native to uh, Chicago? Yes, I grew up in Oak Park. So I lived you, there for 17 years. 17 years in Oak Park, Illinois. I know that area very well. Uh, brothers and sisters? I do. I do have one brother. He is four years younger and he just moved back from Florida. Fantastic. Now, uh, so when you were growing up, did you, um, uh, was mom, mom and dad was in the house or, 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 or single uh, parent uh, household? How did that work out? It was a single parent household, just my mom. So did you ever know your father or meet your, meet your father? No. no really? I never knew my father. Wow. What was that like? What did I tell you? Well, my mom told me that he was Lebanese and there were some struggles in Lebanon and he went back to save his family and he stopped writing. So she believes that he probably got caught up in some war stuff in Lebanon and that's why he stopped writing. He actually wanted to raise me as a Lebanese child and not as a black child. Wow, that's interesting. Um, so what was it like growing up um, without a father, um, even though you knew he existed, but you had never met him? Uh, what was that like? What did your mother tell you about that? Well, my mom told me when I was five that God was my dad. And being five, that worked because I didn't know that there was a process to actually having a child. So that worked. And now that I'm older, I think that was one of the greatest gifts that she could have given me because that was my connection. So when I needed a father, I went to God, which is who my mom told me was my father. But then wow. we, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just said, wow. Yeah, I felt like I didn't really miss it because when I was growing up, most of my girlfriends had single, came from single parent homes too. So, and then I had grandfathers, my, I mean, a grandfather, my grandmother had seven boys. So I had uncles. So it was like, I never really missed it. And for me, I couldn't really miss something that I didn't have, but I always had love. My uncles were there, my godfather, my grandfather, like I always had the male masculine energy. So I didn't really miss anything. And they didn't have 40 years ago or 30 years ago when I was in school, they didn't have daddy. <laughs> I'm aging myself, but they didn't, have daddy. <laughs> they didn't have daddy daughter dances. So I didn't really feel like I missed anything. Fascinating. Fascinating. So 
Uh, I remember reading in your bio uh, that uh, your mom kind of, uh, and something I guess a lot of people don't know about you is that you do have healing hands. You are uh, uh, very holistic very, uh, uh, and, and very healing. A lot of people don't know that about you, um, but it started with, uh, I believe your mom uh, uh, went to acupuncture and did various different things, and that's when you got exposed to uh, the healing arts, if you will. Yes. When I was younger, my mom used to, she, she actually, she was the first black woman to have a free health clinic in Chicago. So she had doctors, dentists, she had all types of people come in who did different modalities. So I remember coming in and her getting needles stuck in her feet or in her legs. And I'm like, wow. And then when I was younger, she would take me to this lady's house that would give her massages and the room was purple and it had beads on it and it was a beautiful feeling. So that's what piqued my interest. Um, so uh, we, we got a little bit about, about your childhood and, and, and kind of coming up. Um, so I, you know, how did you meet um, you know, it's kind of like a, I'm sure it's kind of like a fairy tale uh, uh, marriage or relationship, rather, uh, as many people would, would, would uh, categorize it as. Uh, but how did you end up uh, in the places and spaces to meet uh, your future husband? Actually, my girlfriend, Angel, had, she was like, you're so boring, you never go anywhere. <laughs> So we went bowling and Cat was there with two of his friends and Uncle Don in the book introduced us that evening and he said well whoever loses is going to buy dinner and I'm not buying you dinner and I just met you and I'm not a good bowler like you gotta <laughs> pick something that I can play and that might work but no I'm not taking y'all out to dinner even if I lose. So we met at the bowling alley. You met at the bowling alley. And um, well, come on now, you got to spill the beans and give the details, you know, uh, what happened after the bowling alley? Well, after the bowling alley, we lost and we went to Denny's <laughs> and they paid for it. <laughs> you went to Denny's? Yeah, it was close and I didn't trust them and they probably didn't trust us either. So it was perfect, the neutral <laughs> ground, <laughs> neutral. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. So, so was there an attraction um, between the two of you? No, not originally. Because I just thought he was a big dude. And he always, thought, I mean, that's what he was to me, a big dude. I didn't have a father. So I didn't watch Bears games and, you know, do all the, the sporting events and all that stuff. So to me, he's just a Big ass dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was. <laughs> a big so uh, he he called. He ended up calling you, or you saw each other again. How did that work out? Actually, Don, we did exchange numbers, but then one, I think Monday night football game. Don was cooking, and Don lived with Cat at the time. And Don said, "Hey, why don't you come over?" And I'm like, "Well, who wants me to come over?" And he was like, "Cat." And I was like, well, if he don't call, I ain't coming. So that was the end of that conversation. And then a little bit later, Kat called and was like, you know, I'm cooking and I'm having some friends over. I'd like you to come over. And my girlfriend, Angel, and I went over there. And my I was going to say, don't leave it there now. Wait a minute. Don't stop there. Don't pause there, sister. Come on, bring it on now. Wait a minute. Well, my girlfriend, Angel, wound up leaving with one of the guys that she knew there. And she was the one that drove. So she left me at Kat's house. And so we had a, we just played cards. Well, they played cards because I'm not a card player. But they played cards and played pool and all of that. And Kat was like, all right, I got to go to bed. And I got to go to work tomorrow. And he walked up the stairs. And the next thing I knew, he, he had a blanket and a pillow. And he threw it over the banister and told me good night. Oh yeah. He went back in his room. Okay, yeah. So we we definitely can't pause there. We've got to go f uh, further than that. That's amazing. So so in a, in a sense, he was a complete total gentleman. That's right. That's right. 
Uh, so when did you guys officially start dating? When it, how did that start to unfold and how did you guys fall in love? Well, I, st I used to do outreach programs for my mom. So she w is now a director of two hospitals. So when she, I used to put together programs for her, outreach programs. So we, I would have athletes and doctors and different people come because not everybody wants to be an athlete. So I know to me, if you brought female athletes in to play basketball, that's cool, but I don't want to do that. I want to paint or I want to do something with art or something with my hands. And because that's who I am, I figured there were more people like that. So when my mom told me to bring in people that would stay, talk about either staying in school or saying no to drugs or being safe when you had sex, whatever it was, I found somebody that fit the space and he actually wound up doing an appearance for my mom. And when she met him, she loved him. She was like, you need to date him. You need to date him. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't want an athlete because I had seen my girlfriends with athletes and it didn't turn out well. So right. that's not really something that I wanted. But then we started hanging out and going out to the movies and stuff. And it was no pressure. And he was a really nice guy and he was humongous. So I felt safe. So that's really how it started. Don really cooked and he cooked a lot. So I went over there a lot and Kat would throw the, throw the pillow and the blanket over the banister. And then I went up to his room and I'm like, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm not sleeping on the couch. If I have to stay here tonight, then you're going to sleep on the couch because I'm the guest. And he was like, no, this is my bed. This is my house. And I'm going to bed. I said, well, scoot over and stay on your side of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. OK, keep going. And that's what he did. And then we just started hanging out. I, I can't really say exactly when it was that. I fell in love with him because I wasn't really what I was looking for. I was just enjoying his company and it was no pressure. And we were able to be honest and talk and be stupid because we were young. Sure, sure. Now, uh, you guys married, what was that, tw uh, in 2000? You, you were, uh, were married for uh, uh, 12 years. How long did you guys date before uh, you got married? We dated for four years. Wow, four years, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what was the, uh, how did he propose? Well, we were going on a cruise and he was afraid that when he went through customs, they were gonna find the ring. So he proposed the day we left for the cruise because he didn't wanna be at the airport and have them rummaging through his stuff and him be like, oh, this is what I got for you. So yeah, he proposed, I think actually it was the day before we went on a cruise. He had practice and then we went and he proposed while we were at home. And then the next morning we went to, we had a, we went on a cruise and that was like our engagement cruise. And we went with a couple, another couple that Kat used to play with at the time. And they threw us like a humongous engagement party on the cruise, like it was amazing. Um, so it, it, this kind of sounds like almost like a fairy tale, right? Um, how long was he in the league and where was he at the time in, in, uh, with the Chicago Bears, uh, uh, during this time? He was in the league for 12 years. He started playing in 1991. So he had been playing for five years already. Hmm. Okay. How did your, so you, you tell me about the wedding. It was beautiful. I had a, um, actually my mom's friend was the one that married us and he's been my mom's friend for 40 years now, maybe I'm 41. This, that was my mom's friend. So he married us and we got married here in Chicago. And then I rented out the shed aquarium for our reception. Wow. So, so what was life like? Because, um, you kind of stepped into, a lifestyle that, uh, in, in a sense, didn't have a budget, didn't have limitations. Knowing you now personally, 
that really wasn't your thing, but obviously you played you 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 played the role and accepted it. What was that lavish lifestyle like? It was beautiful, and it was a lot of pressure because Cat was a veteran, and it was a new world to me. So it was like I kind of just had to watch what the other wives were doing and how they behaved, and kind of took what I saw and made it mine so that I was comfortable in myself, still being in that environment. But it was a lot of pressure. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the pressure. Well, since since Cap was a veteran and I was his wife, I was expected to do a whole bunch of things. I was expected to do um, charity events and wives luncheons and whatever else that they had with the wives. And just from watching, first of all, I was we were dating four years before I got married. And I felt like even though we were dating or we were engaged, I was more of a wife to the him at that time than some of the people that really had rings or were wives. So I wasn't invited to the wives' luncheons and whatever until I became Williams. And for me, I wasn't interested anymore because I'm joy. So, but I, I understand the game. I understand that they might, you might be the wife and you might be sitting three rows down from your from the girlfriend or the side chick. So I get it. Mm -hmm. But I, I also feel like if you do that, then when I get the opportunity to do all these lavish or great things, I really don't want to because you're not interested in me. You're mm -hmm. interested in that and what he's doing or his part of it. And they're not really interested in the why. So I really didn't want to do those things. And my mom kept telling me, you know, you need to play your position. You need to play your position. It doesn't look right if Kat is doing something and you're not there. So I started doing that. But yeah. I was very different. Like when I did do things with him, it, I wasn't up front. Like we walked in together and then I went and I sat in this back and I ate and I read my books or I watched, you know, I didn't really, I don't need to be a part of that. That's what he, that's his job. I'm just the support or the cheerleader. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was good. Once you, you know, once you actually get in and still stay yourself for lack of a better word, I can't find a better word for that. But as long as you stay in and keep some of yourself, then you're going to be okay. Like it was, it was a beautiful experience. Like I'm very grateful, even though things didn't work out. I'm grateful because at the end of it, I'm a better joy. So he treated you like a queen, uh, pretty much. It was a great relationship, great marriage. Is that right? It was absolutely beautiful. I remember you telling me that there would be uh, quite a few times actually that he would come home and say, uh, I forgot the term you used. He, uh, you know, I got I got zing today, or uh, what, what was that? I got my bell rung. I got my bell rung. Um, how did you support him? Uh, because you had healing hands. Uh, how did you support Cat through you know being a ball player and and the excruciating uh, physical uh, torment? that's uh, on his body for so many years, I'm sure he was pretty banged up. He was, but for the most part, he came out fairly healthy in terms of his physical body. But I, the, it was actually there, that was another place in my life where I actually learned about my gift because his knees would be hurting. And for some reason, the spirit was like, you can take energy from that knee and put it into the bad knee. So that's what I was doing. And he would be like, your hands are so sweaty and they're getting hot and I feel the pain leaving. And that made me excited because I can't put on a helmet and go out there and block nobody for you. So <laughs> I to, to play my part, but that's where it came about. Like I remember sh transferring energy from his good knee to the bad knee and to the shoulder and working on his ribs and stuff. Like he was my test dummy. 
for <laughs> lack of a better word, when I was learning, because that's what I was doing. I was experimenting with him, the feelings that I had on the inside. Like I could feel it on the inside. I just didn't know what it was going to translate to when it came to the actual touch. So I always say this with people uh, such as yourself, there are certain people that just have a natural ability to move chi or energy or prana, whatever term you want to call it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I believe it's something you're born with and then you develop it even more as you as you uh, mature, if you're lucky. Um, is, is that kind of how you felt with, with your gift? Because you kind of felt like uh, everybody had it because it was you, it was normal, it was something you always had, but you never really shared it with the world. Well, I never really shared it with the world for two reasons. One, because I wasn't real sure. Nobody else was talking about it. So I wasn't real sure. And you know, when you feel like you are the only one experiencing something and nobody is talking about it, you're like, damn, something might be wrong with me or I don't trust it. So that's the place that I was in where I didn't really trust it. And then when I actually started to really trust it, Kat had a problem, like, I don't want you touching on other men. And I felt like, well, damn, it, would, it should be okay for me to touch other men because I'm working out of the house. And when they see you, they not gonna mess with me. That's real talk, right, exactly. That's what I thought. So, All right, so so uh, thank you for sharing that. By the way, when did when did you guys decide? Did you have a planned uh, parenthood kind of thing, or did, did your first child happen by accident? When did children get involved? As soon as we got married, Cat said I belong to him, and he wanted kids immediately. And we joked about it, but with him being an athlete and playing for as long as he had been playing. He wanted somebody to be able to see him play. And I understood that because it's not like being an actor where you can act for 50 years. You have this three chapters of your book, it, of your life, and you better make it work. So when he said that he wanted kids and he wanted them immediately, I understood. So we planned my son. My daughter was not planned. I love her though. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so you planned uh, your son. What's your son's name? Jai. Name you planned Jai. Jai. What was that experience like for the two of you as uh, uh, new parents? How did how did uh, Cat respond to that? He absolutely loved being a dad. He loved being a dad. Like when he would get home from practice, I was able to because he's a night owl. So. I was able to have the evenings off after we ate dinner. I was able to go and do whatever it was that I wanted to do. And he kept Jai until he got ready to go to bed. So he was a great dad. He was very attentive, all of that. I had postpartum. He was very attentive during that. And he didn't say anything about me having postpartum because I really don't think that he could because of where I was in myself. So he might have said something and I probably wouldn't have been able to absorb it or grasp it in the place or the space that he was coming because I didn't really understand. You know, when you're going through something, you really don't understand until you're able to step outside of it and see something different. But he how long were you postpartum? How long? Mm hmm Probably for at least the first. 10 months. Mm -hmm. But it, it was a combination of, huh? No, go ahead. It was a combination of what? Of things. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. But it was a combination of things. You know, you go from, for me, I was a perfect size six, no stretch marks, none of all, none of that tiger stuff, all that extra beauty that we get <laughs> when we become parents. So from, and I gained 80 pounds. So I was 227 pounds at one time. So imagine having this, I was going to call him creature, but this creation 
this beautiful creation. <laughs> and <laughs> so, and he's over there like, yeah, I got 12 needs and I need you to do that right now. So you and your stretch marks and all that emotional stuff that you're feeling right now, I'm going to need you to get my bottle. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it was. So, but Cat was great during that time. He was great. So it sounds like you guys had great marriage, great relationship. Um, and, and it seems like, what, were there any red flags because we're going to get into kind of where things began to shift and change. But uh, looking back, were there any red flags about um, uh, you know, personality shifts or changes? Um, not until he got cut from the Bears. He was okay until he got cut from the Bears. And then when he got cut from the Bears, it seemed like there was a split in his personality that day. And it kept growing. Talk to me about that day. What uh, do you remember uh, when that was? Probably, I think it was either February or March, like the beginning of free agency. I think is when he got released. So of two thousand and three. Two thousand and three. Okay, so um, you had already been uh, together for about five years at that point. When he came home, um, uh, or, or how, how did he find out? Uh, he probably went to over to the facility and somebody told him pretty much, uh, you're done here and clean out your locker. Like I'm sure they used football terms and a football explanation, but yeah, it's pretty much like you go there and you get a pink slip, almost like a regular job. You go and thank you for your services. We don't need you anymore. When he came home, um, did he tell you right away? No. And actually, I found out by watching the news. So when he came in, I just gave him some space because I didn't know what happened. You know, this was our first time getting cut from a team or, you know, being, yeah, being cut. So I didn't really know what was going to happen. But I just let him come in and I watched. I gave him a hug and I watched because I didn't really know what to do. I knew that he was quiet when he came in and he just went to the couch and that was kind of it. And then he started watching TV. ESPN or whatever was on TV about football. That's what he was watching. And so I got a blunt out of our humidor and I went and I sat over there and that's what we did. And, and after our blunt is when he told me that he got cut. Mm. Um, did he have uh, friends, family that uh, uh, supported him through this once uh uh, it, it, it uh, became public? No. No. Nobody came over to see him? Nobody called? Nobody called. Um, there was one guy that called, but he was a coach for Green Bay, and him and Cat were not really friends, so Cat didn't really know why he was calling, and he was like, I didn't mess with him when he played with our team, so I'm not calling him back. And then... Mike Brown was the only other player that came by the day that he got cut. And Mike Brown told his wife that she was going to have to come and get Cat. I mean, come and get him because he was going to get twisted with Cat and he wasn't going to be able to drive home. And because Cat was not in a good place and I didn't know who was ringing the doorbell because they all have a hundred cars. So I didn't recognize the car. So I let them stay outside and Mike's wife called the next morning and, and told me that he was outside. And I could so, but apologize. all of those friends or, or, or acquaintances told, uh, cause you guys used to throw parties every week and uh, you know, big, big uh, extravagant, uh, 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 you know, parties and entertainment. Um, where did all those people go? And, and where was uh, Kat's family in all of this? Well, 
Cat's family was in Pittsburgh. So, and I, they probably felt like I felt. Like, what do, what do we do now? What do we say? Like, what can we do? What can we do to make you feel better? We don't have a job for you. We don't have anything that really can take the place of football. So they were in Pittsburgh. I'm sure they probably, you know, they probably called his cell phone. I mean, they didn't call the house phone, but they probably called his cell phone and spoke to him. But nobody else called other than the guy from Green Bay and then uh, Mike Brown. That was it. More of the wives called to check on me than he had players called to check on him. But the game wow. That's that's painful just hearing it. Uh, so he was pretty much alone, other than of course uh, family, his immediate family. You, uh, so would you say he went into a depression, or, or uh, how did his mood uh, begin to shift? You said he changed the day, that day. Uh, how how did that out picture? What did that look like? Well, it looked like him staying in the basement for three months in the dark. He didn't shower. He didn't shave. He didn't open the blinds, and he did not turn the lights on. And it was like that for three months. And I would I would talk to my mom and she would be like, well, you have to let him grieve. You have to let him grieve. You've never had a job for 12 years that you've loved. And she was right, because I never had a job for 12 years. So yeah, yeah. That I love. So Well, it wasn't just also a job because it's also that you are you're a celebrity, you are a football star. Um, uh, you know, one of the most famous teams in the world. Obviously, I'm from Chicago, so I'm biased. But, you know, uh, go Bears no matter what. Um, but, you know, so I, I guess I'm looking at it from his perspective is that obviously he did not have a plan B. Um, you know, a lot of players go in. There's, uh, they go in very young. They're so excited to be a part of the league. They do anything for the league. Uh, it becomes their life and their lifestyle. And I guess they never think that one day it could end, perhaps through an injury, uh, and God forbid that you're cut, because that's something I think you can never really see coming. So what do you do after that? Who, who are you um, uh, after that? What do you do? Um, a lot of people don't really have plans. And Cat was one of those players or people that didn't really have a plan. I think in his mind, he felt like he was going to play 71 years, and at the last game he was on walking off the field, he was going to drop dead and be inducted into the Hall of Fame and beautiful. I mean, that's what he thought. <laughs> that's what he thought. Never, you, so you never had a conversation about that? Never had a conversation about what after football, what, what are you going to do? Never had that conversation? No, I felt like if he didn't want to do anything – then he didn't have to do anything because he had played for 12 years and, you know, he had given his mind, body, and spirit to his job and to his love. I always used to say football was his wife and I was the mistress because football was his first love, <laughs> which I understood because football was here before I got here. Sure. So I understood. Sure. And then... Yeah, he didn't really have a plan for afterwards. So three months in the basement, um, uh, what, what what began to transpire from, from that? When did the marriage begin uh, from your perspective? Uh, when did it begin breaking down? Uh, maybe five or six months after that because I just, he was just moping around like he didn't he watched ESPN and played his little Xbox or whatever game was out, but there was nothing else like there was no. Let's take a walk, baby, or any of the things that we used to do. There was none of it. He was just absolutely closed inside himself. And it was did you suggest any of those things? I'm sorry. Did you try to? Did you suggest any of those things? Did you try to get him out the house, or you know? Yeah. Well, at that time, my son and I used to go to dinner every Thursday to a Chinese bistro, and I would invite him every week, and he just didn't want to go. So I would often just bring him dinner home, 
from the place that we went because he just didn't want to go. And, you know, I had my mom over here like, you need to be praying more and you need to just let him be. And I understand and overstood all of that. I know that's your word. <laughs> that's a joyism, ladies and gentlemen. We'll get into that in a moment. Go ahead, Joy. So I overstood, understood all of those things. But at some point, what are we going to do now? Like, my son doesn't know who has a job. He just knows my daddy ain't really playing with me right now. He's not doing all the things and flipping and running and doing all the things that we usually do. So now mommy's over here trying to be a player and I'm not really a good player when it comes to playing with boys. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not that. I'm not a rough houser. I'm not any of that. I'm like, let's sit and paint. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, let's wrestle. And, and that's dad. That's dad. I'm not a wrestler. So clearly he was depressed. He had completely tuned out at this point. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and that, of course, you know, they say uh, when whoever is depressed in the house, everybody is depressed in the house. That's right. Um, do you, uh, so, so walk me through uh, a little bit more, because obviously uh, it became more toxic uh, and, and, and devastating uh, for you, especially to the point where you file for divorce. Walk me through that process where you went from those, you know, uh, uh, you know, the three months, five or six months that year to saying, hey, you know, I, I can't take this anymore. What started to progress in his behaviors? Um, his sleeping patterns changed, his drinking patterns changed. Like he used to just drink Jack and Coke. Then it was like he drank whatever was available, whatever it was, it didn't even matter. And that was a little concerning to me. So I think that was probably the first part is that his, his personality slowly started to change and his sleeping, the way he interacted with people was different. Like he was sometimes short, like to the point that he'd be snippy or snappy at people and they didn't understand why he wasn't feeling like talking. They just wanted to autograph or they wanted to know whatever was happening with the team. You know, they don't really know or care even about the player and who they are or what they are. Nobody really cared about who James was. They just cared about who Big Cat was. And so that was a struggle for him because nobody ever said, hey, James, how are you doing? It was like, they were always like, hey, big cat, can I get a ticket? Can I get an autograph? Can I get a picture? Can you do something for this person? So it, it wasn't like anybody ever really paid attention to him. So when we went out- So they were very superficial relationships, basically. It was fans and it's pretty much superficial. That's right, that's right. And even with some family, you know, they have gotten accustomed to him being big cat and not necessarily being James. So if you come to see Big Cat, you're going to have a different experience than you have if you were to talk to James. They're like two different people. Fascinating. So, yeah. It was different. It was different. Okay, so, so continue. Walk me through when it started becoming uh, toxic. Because the other thing that, that uh, uh, you know, you alluded to in the book and that came out uh, uh, rec re literally recently in the media is this concept called football, uh, what is it, post-traumatic football syndrome or uh, CTE and um, some crazy r number of uh, uh, ball players uh, have it uh, and we saw the movie Concussion uh, and I remember you saying you saw the movie and it was like an aha moment for you that many of the things in there you said, oh my God, I experienced that. But of course, at the time you were living it long before uh, there was ever such a thing as, uh, you know, post-traumatic football syndrome or, or CTE. Uh, so you just thought, you, you know, the guy that you loved had completely 
shifted and maybe it was just depression. You didn't know what it was, or it could have still been depression, uh, albeit extreme depression. You just didn't have language for it, but you were experiencing it in real time. That's right. That's right. Because he definitely changed. His personality changed. Everything about him changed. The way he took care of himself, the way he took participated and was was present with his children like he was happy before and then once the depression kicked in it was like it got fur further he got further and further away i think he got further and further away from himself and further away from his family or me i mean the kids well at that time we only had one but you know, I just wanted to play. So, and he doesn't have a language yet, too, to be like, Daddy, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. And he stayed in. Like, Cat stayed in for a long time. And nobody really came over. Like, none of his friends came over. Nobody came. Whenever we had visitors, they were my friends and my visitors. Like, nobody ever came to see him or check on him. But then when they he goes outside, it's like, can I get your autograph? So, in when... People are asking for autographs. So he had literally no support system at all. None. Wow. None. So he was alone in a in, in a very real sense. He was alone. He definitely was. He definitely was. And I don't even think that he knew that he was depressed at the time. Because when you're standing in it, you can't see. Sure. Sure. Uh, when did your second child come about? How, uh, what? Was that, you said it was kind of a, that was not a planned uh, pregnancy. Uh, where were you in your marriage with Kat at the time of your, uh, 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 that you found out you, you were pregnant uh, with your daughter? We were struggling. And I had been asking him to go to counseling and he just didn't want to go. So in 2005, I had hernia surgery. And because Kat wanted a second child, and I was supposed to get my hernia fixed before I, I ha got pregnant again. So I, I had my hernia fixed and 11 weeks or two weeks later, I got sick. It was morning sickness. So I was 11 and a half weeks pregnant when I had my hernia fixed. So wow. that was a struggle for me because cat was changing. My marriage was changing. And now I have another child that I'm going to have to bring into what is looking like a dysfunctional situation because that's what it felt like. I mean, I think for the first six months after I found out that I was pregnant, I probably cried every day. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did because Kat and I were not in a place where, and I think we weren't in a place because he wasn't in a place. I don't feel like he could really feel himself. So if you can't feel yourself, you can't feel anybody else. Was he excited about the baby? Was he, you know, so he, he obviously wasn't the same with, with this pregnancy as he was with this child as he was with his uh, first son. Um, I don't really know if he was excited or not because by that point, he didn't smile very much. So, I didn't really know what he was feeling or thinking. You know, I, I know that before we got married, we said we were going to have two children. And I felt like here I'm fulfilling my end of the bargain. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. He was kind of far away. He was far away. I feel like the second pregnancy um, was a little more difficult for me emotionally, but I feel like it was just as difficult for him emotionally. I mean, I had the hormones going on inside of me and he had stuff, for lack of a better word, going on inside of him. Like I could understand where mine was coming from, right? I got all mm -hmm. the hormones, I'm carrying a baby, I'm supposed mm -hmm. to get the hormones. But for him, who are you? Mm -hmm. who are you? Mm -hmm. Where's that other guy at? And so it was rough. When did it start getting toxic? Because I mean, reading your book, and um, again, someone looking at you, especially looking at uh, a football player's wife, um, 
you know, you, you think that, no, nah, that can't be happening. That's crazy. Um, but it got pretty crazy for you based upon what you, you wrote in here. Um, you said, it went, well, there were many pieces. I mean, there, the house kind of got let go. You were dealing with mold. Uh, you said there were trees. And it's not funny, but it was kind of funny the way you told it to me. It was trees growing in the house. Uh, damn near. Uh, it, it, was, it was just a, a lot of those little things started to, to build up. Um, but then, uh, you know, he really started, uh, I, I guess not the term getting physical with you, but uh, because you weren't physically abused, but uh, there was some, there was a lot of emotional turmoil uh, uh, that was afflicted upon you uh, based upon what you were saying in here, what are some of those things that, that um, uh, happened to you when it really got bad? Well, first, the house, that was really bad for me because who lets their house fall apart? And I know that you said there were trees damn near growing. No, there were trees growing in the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was trying to be nice. I was trying to, you know, smooth it over a little bit. Because right. it's hard for people to comprehend that. You know, you're living in a multi-million dollar mansion. Um, you think that it's palatial. Uh, and I'm sure there was parts of it that perhaps were. You don't think of that lifestyle and uh, the connection between uh, trees growing in the house unless you are actually just planting a tree in the house because that's your thing, you know. But this wasn't the case with you. No, it wasn't the case with me. Um, we had trees growing in three of our rooms in our house. So at Thanksgiving, if you needed a centerpiece, I could have pulled some of those sticks <laughs> and made a centerpiece for your table and your table and the three other people that are watching right now, their tables too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. All right. I, I'm trying not to laugh because this is not a really funny story, but that was funny. Okay. So it was that bad. Yes. All right. So, so let the house, he, 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 he let the house and, 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 you know, in all fairness to him, he's depressed. I, I'm sure the last damn thing on his mind was, you know, keeping up a damn house. Um, but, you know, one would think just, you know, have people that do that all the time to just come over and take care of that stuff. Uh, but obviously, the or, or 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 whatever. Uh, and then there was this issue with the with the mold. I guess you literally had to find out that it had toxic mold in the house. It, it was it was it started to become dilapidated in a sense. I guess. Yeah, we had mold. We had a lot of mold, and um, I actually had to have a court order for him to get it fixed because I don't know if he felt like he didn't see it or it didn't really matter. Like, I don't really know where he was. I just know that that wasn't the dude that I married and something was not right within himself because our whole house was falling down. I mean, we had mold everywhere and it was like a 6.6 .6 mold. The legal limit is one. The limit of mold is one. We had 6.6. .6. Wow, so that, that's very toxic. Um, it also contributes to uh, uh, yeah, black mold, which contributes to depression and, and all of those things and sicknesses, illness, asthma, all of that. One of the reasons why I have asthma. Uh, so this is fascinating because it, it, it sounds like this guy is completely tuned out. I mean, he just was not there. What did you guys, what did he do on, on a regular basis of during the day? Would he just, was he out and came home? And uh, what was that daily interaction like? Well, for a while, he was just at home. And I just let him be at home because my mom kept saying, you need to pray. You need to let him have his time. And so I did. And I did for a while until it's like, I need you back in this marriage. I need you to be a part of it. I need you to be a part of taking our, our son to school and 
being a part of our lives. Like he was so far away, even though we were in the same house, mentally he was far away. Emotionally, that was non-existent. Do you recommend counseling? I recommend the counseling for many years, for almost five years. And he didn't seem to want to go. We went once, but he didn't feel good about what came out when we went to counseling. So he said he didn't want to go again. And I told him we didn't have to go, but you have to learn how to speak to me and how to communicate with me so that we can get through this issue or whatever it is, come to some kind of resolution. But I asked him to go to counseling for a long time, but as long as people are out there, when he goes out that are at the gas station or like, big cat, can I get this? Can I get that? And let me take a picture with you. Then it seems like I'm just riding his butt. Like it doesn't seem like support with when that's where I was coming from, even though it probably at the time didn't, didn't seem like I was coming from that place because I see <laughs> my house falling down. I see you not being communicative anymore. You're not smiling. Like when we did go places, I had to be like, baby, don't forget to smile. Don't forget to smile. Be nice and don't forget to smile. And that's not something that I had to tell him. Like he was okay. He was, he spoke to people, he shook hands. He was normal. And then after a while, it just got to be like, he wasn't anymore. And like you said, the depression kind of takes over the house. The energy takes over the house. Uh, in the book, uh, you, you write that um, he started keeping the kids away from you. Um, and um, uh, you said one of the final straws was when he put two guns uh, in your Victoria's Secret, uh, you say in my Victoria's Secret toiletry bag and hung it next to my clothes. And you said not only did he put guns uh, in my closet, he would sprinkle bullets uh, in my sock drawer over my and, and over my socks. Uh, that's a radical shift. Uh, and, you know, I and and I'm sure people would say, "Well, Joy, you know, okay, so he's not, you know, maybe he's snappy, maybe he's, you know, not emotionally available. He's still obviously depressed, uh, even though he's not getting counseling or what have you." But when I hear when I read this. That's a dramatic shift uh, in, in mindset. And, and, and this was just one of those kind of incidences that occurred. When did that begin? Probably began after, after I filed for divorce. That's when a lot of it started coming. Like he was far away before that emotionally, but when I started, when I filed for divorce is when he really started bullying me. And that was, yeah, that was a little scary. I mean, to go in your closet and find your toiletry bag. And I grabbed the bag thinking like, what, what's this? And he's got two guns in there. And then I go and I look through my sock drawer and there's bullets in my drawer or bullets. We had California closets, fix our closet. So we, the, one of the, the drawers had like spaces for rings and that also had bullets in it. And so while we were going through this, Junior Seau killed himself and a few other players. And this is all during the time that I'm getting a divorce. So I'm at home noticing these things. And then this is what's happening out in the real world. So, but this is the real world in my house with this dude that I don't know anymore. Uh, talk to me about the. That's that's uh, that's amazing. Um, uh, there was a radical shift in and uh, in his personality, but it, it was far by how you file. Uh, what led you? Well, uh, here's a stupid question: What led you up to filing? Uh, was there anything that extreme that was occurring prior to your filing, or was it that you were just literally sick and tired of being sick and tired? Well, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, but I was going to stay. If he want, if we wanted to go to counseling and we could have worked on some things, I would have stayed because I feel in my heart that I came here to be his wife. So 
and I'm going to be his wife, whether that's on paper or not, because nobody else can handle him the way that I'm built to. That's my job. So whether we're here together or we aren't, it doesn't matter. But I know that it was scary for me to have this gentle giant and somebody that I love now keeping my kids away from me and standing over me while I'm asleep. And when I came home one day that he had torn some of the doors off the frames and sent me a text about if I lock any doors in his house, he's going to take off all the doors and put them in the garage. And each time I call my attorney, they're like, okay, I'm going to call Kat's attorney and we'll straighten it out. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, it was, well, you mentioned in the book that, um, Take your clothes and put them in bags and put them outside and, and, and things. Or walk me through some of that. Yeah, he's you were sitting. You were sitting in your car. I was, I was, because well, he did start taking my stuff and putting them in boxes. And then he first he started putting them in the garage, and I didn't really know what to feel about that. Are you being mean, or are you trying to? make me disappear. From the garage, he moved the boxes and got a, a pod on the side of the house and put all my stuff in there. So I didn't really understand other than something's wrong with him, what was really happening. I just knew that I was afraid and I knew that he had stood over me when I slept. So I had a hammer under my bed under my mattress until my daughter found it. So it was scary. And when you say stood over your bed to watch, uh, you, you would wake up and he would be standing over your bed. What do you mean? Well, at, at that time, I was sleeping in my son's room. And I woke up and he had let himself inside my son's room. And then he closed the door. And I woke up and he's like standing there. And he didn't say anything. He was just standing there staring at me. And so it was like I didn't know whether I should get up and try to move. Or I just remember thinking, if you need to escape, you have to jump through the middle pane of the glass. Because you can't hit the wood. You're going to be extra hurt. And he just stood there and he looked at me. And so I just kind of stood laid there and kind of looked at him because I didn't know what else to do. And eventually he opened the door and he left and he closed the door. And when he closed the door and left and I heard him walk away from the room, I got up and I got my stuff and I went to the police department and I told them what happened. And they gave me this little flyer about know your rights and bullying and mental cruelty is domestic violence and Make sure you have a plan to escape and all of these things. Like, that didn't do anything for me. Just like it doesn't do anything for any other woman that goes to the police department after she's been bullied or emit, or abused in some form. Uh, so, it's, you know, and there's too many to mention because there's quite a bit in the book, but there was a lot of, uh, uh, I, I call micro events that kind of build, built up uh, over time um, in a relatively short period of time, especially after you had filed. Um, and at, at one point, uh, you, you mentioned uh, that you got bullied at home and raped in court. Um, very powerful word, very powerful statement. Um, what happened uh, in that uh, event or series of events of going to court and thinking you're going to get your kids and find out that you're not. Well, court was um, not good. First of all, if you don't have any money and if you're not a star and you're going up against a star, you've already lost. So that was number one. But I believed in, in the court system at first. I believed that, okay, we've got a prenup. It's fairly easy. He said he wanted to keep the house and I could take the kids. Like I felt like it was going to be a smooth transition. And 
really when he found out how much he was going to have to pay in child support on top of my prenup money, he decided he wanted to keep the kids. And that's when he started doing more with the kids and being more present and doing more appearances because that's what they were appearances with the kids so that when he goes to court, he can be like, I did this and I did this and I did that. But the only reason you were able to do that is because you kept them away from me. They were kept away from me for almost two years. In 2010 is when he started keeping the kids away from me. So it just got progressively worse after that. Plus the bullying and mental cruelty. That's I have to go. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is who was your support when you were going through this? Um, you uh, at one point had a, you know, a great relationship with your mother. Um, how did your mother counsel you, uh, through this, uh, through this event? She didn't. She told me if something was wrong in the relationship, it was me. And that she would have no further conversation with me about my marriage. I could only talk to her about my grand, about her grandkids. And that changed our relationship forever. Like, it's not that we won't have a relationship in the future, but mm -hmm. that changed our relationship. And I felt like my support system were, were, people in school or people in my classes or the chiropractor's office that I worked at, those beca they became my family because I didn't have anybody else to go to. I thought my mom, she would be the one that I should have been able to go to. Plus, whenever we were traveling or doing something, Kat always took my mom. So I feel like if you're able to be here during the good times, then stand up during the bad times. And she just didn't. She felt like Kat had to be right. And I just had to let her be with that. Wow. So, so you, you had a, a double betrayal in a sense, uh, especially that one you didn't see coming at all. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, you wrote very affectionately in the book about Uncle Don, uh, who obviously is responsible for you guys hooking up. Uh, so talk, tell me about Uncle Don and how uh, he kind of stepped in and became like a, 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 in a sense, like a father figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, on, Don was the best man at our wedding. And I danced with Don, I, after I did my first dance with Kat, I danced with Don. And Don said something to me on my wedding night. He said, I'm Joy, I'm giving Jim to you. If he gets out of line, bring his ass back. And, wow. and going through. And so Don like called in the middle of the day, which he never does. And he asked me, his text message said, are you free? Just the letter R, the letter U and the word free. And we talked for several hours that day. And of course he told me to pray too, which is, is beautiful. I'm not against praying, but right now I need some fleshly help something that is a little bit closer, something that I can, you know, see and feel and touch. We both needed that. And so that's what Don tried to be. And he was Kat's friend longer than he had been my friend. So I felt like Kat was out of line. So that's where I needed to take him to because Don was really the only one in Kat's life that ever stood up to Kat. Everybody else is like, oh, you paying for it? Yeah, you're right. And that's not the case. So Don was really, really a big help. Was Don there for Cat during the time when he was going through the depression? What was, what was Don's role with Cat uh, and relationship with Cat during the uh, during this time when when nobody else was coming to see or support him? Well, it was strange because Cat felt like since Don never played in the NFL, he didn't understand the struggles that he had. And nor was Don married and Don doesn't have any children. So on one hand, Kat felt like, how can you tell me anything and you haven't experienced any of these things? So I get that part. But then 
I also get that this is my friend of 30 plus years. They knew me when we had to share shoestrings, like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so it was rough. It was definitely rough. It was rough for Don because he couldn't believe that his friend was being that or tur had turned into that. And several times Don would be like, I enjoy, I owe you an apology. Things are worse than even you said. And I saw things in your house that were wrong that you didn't even tell me about. And at first I just felt like you were an e being an emotional girl because I couldn't believe that my friend that I had known for 30 plus years is doing these things. And I just couldn't see it. But then when I got here and I saw it for myself, the only thing I can do is apologize to you. And he tried to talk to Kat several times and Kat wasn't interested. So I don't know if it was purely based on the fact that Don didn't play and Don wasn't married and Don didn't have any children, or if it was the fact that he probably just maybe didn't know. He probably didn't have the words because even though I'm not in it anymore, I'm just now getting the words. And I'm just now getting the language and I'm just now getting the understanding of everything that's, that's going on. Because when you're going through it, it just looks like a, a mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were all messes. So you, you, you obviously lost, your, uh, lost custody of your children. Uh, do you have a relationship with them now? Uh, and if so, what is that like? And most of the time it's on speakerphone because I think that. So you have not seen them? No, I haven't. How, how, how long has this been? Over a year. You haven't seen your kids in a year? Right. Wow. And you only talk to them on the phone how often? Um, I call every night, but we don't talk every night. My son's in wrestling now and my daughter's doing some things, some activities too. So. I call when I think that they're at home. So usually I call around eight, between eight and eight fifteen. How has that affected you and, and uh, as a, as a mother that you have not been able to see your children uh, in a year, and you're only able to talk to them sporadically on on, on a phone call? Uh, it ripped half of my heart out. That's what it did, and my heart had to regenerate itself the ventricles all of that it had to find a new pathway to keep me alive because a child's love is unconditional right you can look however you want to look and they're like mommy you're so beautiful you're so beautiful i love you and you need that that's what I needed because that was the only love that I had being poured into my cup at the time. So when I lost my kids, what was left? I felt like what was left. So it was devastating that it was. And I think that I, I can't, I won't say I think, I'll say I know that I went through my own depression for different reasons. No doubt, I'm sure you did. Um, when did you decide to write about this? And I'm sure it was an extremely cathartic process to put this down uh, on paper and then put it into a book. Uh, uh, you know, uh, just reading some of the passages in there, uh, you know, as they say, a grown ass man is gonna come to tears uh, reading uh, some of the passages in this memoir. Uh, when did you decide to put this in a book and why? writing it in 2012 after my divorce was over um, that's when I started writing it but when I first when I first started writing it I wrote it as um, a bitter chick mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's what it was and so it took me a couple years and it took me turning in my book to the editor and reading it and being like, damn, is that you? 
is that you? Mm -hmm. And I and that was it, it was very healing for me to write the book because I could read it and then I could also see myself at the same time, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's not inside of you anymore, it's outside of you where you can see it. And so when I turned in the book the first time, I was real proud of it because I was done. But then when I read it again, I'm like, that's real ugly. Like, even though parts of the story is ugly, like, I didn't want it to be where it was all ugly. I wanted it to be truthful, and I wanted it to be me. But And I wanted it to help other people because there's nothing new under the sun. So, and I knew that I wasn't the only one going through it. So I wrote it so that really so that I could get it off of me. I feel emotionally 30 pounds lighter after finishing the book and getting it off. What is, what is, or if you haven't seen your children in a year, do you have any relationship or conversation with Kat at all? No, he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to talk to me at all. He tells me I need to talk to his attorneys or talk to the child rep or those are the people that he feels like he, he wants me to talk to. But I feel like that's dumb. I feel like it's dumb. The attorneys don't care about you. They don't care about your family. The child rep doesn't care about anything, you're, you or your family either. So I feel like if you and I were the ones that created these children, at one point we loved each other enough to have these kids and even though the relationship doesn't work or didn't work if it came when it comes down to it and i if if i have my children there would be nobody else that i would want to share those things with like the baby mm -hmm. on my son's foot that's cat's foot foot who else is going to know that those are things that i should be able to or we should be able to share together because we created that and but he's angry and i gotta let him or it run its course just the same way that mine had to run its course if you had the opportunity he was watching um right now since you haven't had a conversation with him what would you tell him i would tell him to Number one, go and get his head checked and put his name on the CTE list. I would definitely tell him that. Um, I don't really know if I would, what else I would tell him other than can we be peace and can we raise our kids and, and co-parent in peace? Like that's really it. I don't really have anything else you know i don't have any blame to put on anybody i don't have any of those hurt feelings and all of that ugliness i don't have those things anymore but i know that if it took me this long to get to that place of forgiveness and compassion and understanding and overstanding i know no no offense but i know that men they're gonna take two weeks longer and they're going to arrive two weeks longer. I mean, hey, what you saying? What you trying to say, Joy? What you trying to say about us men folks? I love uh, you. I, I don't know. You're, you're absolutely right. I remember Jimmy Fox uh, eloquently talking on the show saying, women bend and men break. Uh, and, and that is hugely metaphoric and hugely true. Um, knowing what you know now, uh, if, if, would you have changed anything? Um, well, with my children, yes, I would have taken my kids and we would have had to just sleep in my car or at my girlfriend Sophie's house like she offered. That, with that, yes. Now with Kat, I guess maybe if some of this information was out, then I probably would have been more, a little bit more compassionate. But because the information wasn't out and there was no communication between us and nobody was talking about CTE or post-traumatic football disorder, mm -hmm. we really talking about it. So 
to me, he just looked like an angry, crazy dude. And, <laughs> and I'm not one to, you can't be aggressive with me. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be safe. That doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy or loved. Uh, what advice would you give, because uh, uh, now, uh, unfortunately, perhaps fortunately for others, you are an expert uh, on this topic subject, what would you give uh, to, to other foot, uh, football players' wives, ex-wives, uh, and players themselves? Well, for the ladies, um, save you some money. Put it away. And I know that when I was going through it and my girlfriends told me to put money away, I felt like that was being deceitful. And today, yeah, I would have put some money away. And I would have gone to school. Like I, I while Kat was playing, I stayed home and raised the house. And ra I mean, raised the house. So I did that too. But raised the kids. <laughs> Cut the trees in the, in the living room. No, go ahead. <laughs> Right, just throw a little glitter on this, all right. <laughs> but <laughs> I would definitely tell the ladies to stay true to who they are. Like it's it's a it's a, another world that you step into. Like, but you have to keep your friends, you have to keep your family. You know, I mean, the ones that will stay, and you need a support system, and and you need a support system outside of the game. Because once the game is over, for you, because it ends for all of us at some point, and it's going to leave us all behind at some point. So you need relationships and people that really love you, whether or not the game is here or it isn't. So you, you definitely need that. And, yeah, I would tell them to tell the ladies to just go to school or do whatever they wanted to do, have a business, whatever it is. Make sure that you have your own rainy day fund because we all have them. And at the end of the day, if you save the money and 70 years later and y'all are still together, you can put that together and take another vacation. But you definitely need a, a rainy day fund. You definitely need that. And for the fellas, I think I would tell them to communicate. Because when somebody loves you, they see you changing or see something different in you, sometimes even before you as a person can see it. So I feel like it's a partnership and you have to listen. And when somebody loves you, you need to listen and you need to make sure that you allow them to be a team player. It's not your team not just your team we are a team together and i definitely think that they need to get their education and have plans for after football whatever that looks like if you're just gonna golf or whatever that looks like for you whatever you love outside of football that's what you need to build up while you're still in football so that it's not like this big empty space of who am I and what am I going to do now and how should I do it? So you, you definitely have to have some kind of game plan after the game is over. Definitely. Last question, Joy, and that is when the book came out, uh, you literally uh, was bombarded and swamped by uh, love all around the world. Uh, people uh, wrote in uh, to you personally. You were saying on your Facebook page, on uh, the your your uh, page where the book is. Uh, what were some of the things that that uh, people said uh, to you that uh, let you know that you're loved and supported? Well, I had probably about ten people to fifteen NFL wives reach out to me and tell me that they were super proud of me for using my voice and to continue using it. And I got so much love from the wives. It was amazing. And they were all like, yes, I felt that way. I'm glad you're using your voice because 
I'm afraid to, or, and I even got, I got messages from men that have read the book that are like, damn, I've done that to somebody, or I've thought about doing that to somebody. And because I read it, now I don't want to do those things anymore, or I see how it'll affect somebody. And, and I've even had ladies that have experienced domestic violence and they're like, use your voice because my dude was a mail carrier and nobody cared and nobody listened when I was getting beat up or being abused in whatever form that abuse came in. And they felt like I had the platform. And for a while, I didn't want the platform. Who, who wants to be like, yeah, I'm the girl that had the mental and emotional abuse from domestic violence. That ain't really so. Look, I want to do glitter and purple and candles <laughs> and rhinestones. That's where I want to do. But I, you said you didn't sign up for this, but it, obviously you had an assignment by something much higher because you know, you're doing you're doing it well. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been amazing. Joy artist uh, uh, Williams, uh, I remember you saying this is probably the last time that you will use Williams. Your next book that you're working on it will just be Joy Artist from this point on. Is that right? Yes. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, well, I'm excited that, that you did this book. I'm excited that you um, stood your, your, your ground, told your truth. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a lot of truth in this book. You won't be able to put it down. So when you do get it, make sure you have nothing else to do because you're not going to be able to just like read a couple of sentences or paragraphs or maybe even a chapter and say, oh, well, now I'm going to go and, you know, cook or go shop it. No, you're going to get you some coffee or whatever your drink is, whatever, sit down and you be, oh my God, what? Oh, hell no. He did what? And it's, it's one of those. It is absolutely amazing. Um, and unfortunate because you lived it and had to go and grow through it. And in, in, in a very real sense, you're still going through it because we don't know the outcome of what's going to happen. we be able to see your children again. Uh, and so we're, uh, you know, I'm praying for you. There are people who are holding you up in the light around the country, around the world, that uh, at least uh, if the marriage is over, that uh, there can be some level of resolution where you can at least be mommy again to uh, your children, even if it's not necessarily the, you know, co-parenting or, or pie in the sky, but at least you would be able to hug your children, love your children, and, and have access to them um, as, as, a, as a mother, as a parent. So I, 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 I wish you the best uh, uh, moving forward and getting closer to that resolution. All right, my dear. So uh, you're welcome to come back anytime. Of course, you're going to come back because I know what the next book is going to be about. So I got to have you back on the show. Uh, and uh, feel free to come back and talk about anything that happens new, if there's a new resolution or anything that's going on. I want to be the first to know about it. Of course, you will. You know, I'll be in your inbox in like five minutes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joy, thank you so much. Stick around and hang out with me in the green room for a little bit as I sign off. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Philippe Matthews Show After Hours, thank you for tuning in. This was a, an amazing story with an amazing woman uh, who uh, uh, many people don't get access to to ask some of those deeper heartfelt questions and have an elongated, deep interview uh, on, on the inside of uh, an ex-ball player's wife. The, the book title is... Uh, cat I know, Diary of Ball Player's Ex Wife, uh, available right now on Kindle. I believe in the next 30 days it'll be available as a paperback. Uh, go get it. Uh, pre order the paperback if you can. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Philippe Matthews Show after hours. Take care, everybody. <laughs>